Welcome and, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join me and hopefully I can share a little bit with you about the history of reference checking and how to turn it into a very strategic tool for your organization looking at quality of hire and reducing turnover. And interesting um, information from the poll. We, we run into this all the time. There are a lot of people that um, are checking references, yet still 24% are not checking references. And there's a real valid reason for that. We'll kind of talk about historically why that seems to be. And then, in fact, you know, you're using that information to make hiring decisions. But I hope to share with you more information, how you can really uh, pull back the covers and dig deep and really understand the behaviors of your candidate to make even a, a better hiring decision and maybe a higher quality decision. So I'm going to start with kind of the, the history of reference checking, we all know, and you guys confirmed, it's an important step in the process. And that, you know, the hiring managers typically in the past, you know, they would just pick up the phone, make a phone call to another organization. There were no issues with that. And, you know, you talk about, you know, tell me about Joe. You know, how was he from day to day? Um, what are kind of the nuances? Where do I need to be aware of his uh, performance improvement issues, and, and how can I support him to really be a terrific team player? What are the challenges? And what you got from that was some real actionable information. Um, you know, hopefully it helped you make a decision. It, you know, again, helped you screen out some of those folks that maybe were not meeting some of the criteria. And, you know, you wanted this information to really uh, be useful to help that person when they did join the organization that you could leverage it for some, um, you know, get them started quickly and to be successful and pro um, productive right away. And then, most importantly, you wanted to make sure that that information was going to help you predict the behavior. Were they going to stick with you? Were they going to be an A player? And those are the things that you were looking for in this information. You know, again, historically on the phone, you, you ask some of this information, but typically you don't get real deep core information that's going to help you make a better hiring decision. You may get dates of employment. Almost always we'll get that information. You may get rehire eligibility, which sometimes doesn't really mean anything. Um, so, you know, the, the information that you're looking for are what are the behaviors around the interpersonal skills, the teamwork, work ethics, you know, the integrity of this individual. Do they fit into the values of the organization? When you say integrity, what does that mean to your company? And how do you ensure that that person really exhibited integrity in the past? Because we all know past behavior is a key indicator of future behavior. So, you know, reference checking typically was always done the traditional method, pick up the phone, make a phone call. We've done that in the 70s. Some of us can remember the 70s. Um, and there are probably others that, that are not aware of the 70s. But, you know, that was really common back then, 70s and 80s. And then you kind of saw it trail off into the 90s. People really got nervous about reference checking. And so it kind of took a big dip. And there were probably more, not only 24%, but I would submit that there were probably a lot of folks that weren't doing reference checking or stopped because of the concern. Um, so what Skill Survey is looking at is how can we make this relevant? The information, how can you get that information that's relevant to your organization? And, and should it be? And, and I think it should be. So let's talk about that a little bit. Why did it take that big dip in the 90s? Well, I think you guys all know, you know, the very litigious society that we live in today. Um, there were a lot of legal issues that came about during that time. HR then started really cracking down on organizations and making sure that it was a controlled process. So nobody was to give out any reference information. Don't say the wrong thing. You don't want to get the the organization in trouble, and there's a huge risk associated with that. If an organization wanted to do it, then 
you know, there were, or, you know, companies that were outsourcing that and saying, hey, I can put a box around this. We'll ask just these questions. It won't get you into any trouble. It won't get us into any trouble. Um, and so we can just give you some real surface level information. It may not help you really make a better hiring decision, but it'll give you something. And then, of course, you know, there were many organizations that simply stopped checking references. Um, the one thing that I think you guys all know, those of you that are using the traditional phone method, is that you spend lots of time, or a recruiter or an admin spends lots of time on the phone or email, tracking people down, trying to get on their calendar, try to find 30 minutes for them to talk to you. And it can take a week or longer just you know, to enact that process. And then you actually have to have that conversation. And sometimes it takes you know, 20, 30 minutes to really get you know, any kind of information. And then more often than not, you still get surface level information. So it really is, you know, we have found that in the past you just simply couldn't get past that and you got real, simply no actionable information. So why is that a problem? I mean, you know, the candidate comes to you well prepared. Uh, they do a really nice job in presenting themselves. Of course, we all say, you know, if somebody asks me if I'm a team player, you bet I am. And, you know, I show up for work on time, I don't use Facebook, I, I don't waste any of my day. I'm absolutely ethical. And that's what you hear from all of your candidates. Um, they're they're well trained. They have read every book that's out there about how to interview well. And most of them come across very polished. And, and then, of course, most of them have the credentials that would go along with that. So if you've got somebody who's interviewing really well and they have the credentials, then you would think that, you know, all is fine. Um, so, the one thing that you know this does, if you, and there are a number of, of tools out there today that really look at um, the individual. So you know you're you're looking at from the candidate's perspective. There's personality assessments. There's self assessments that say, what do I think of myself? I'm going to share that with you. And what the reference checking process does is moves that to a 360. So I'm sure some of you maybe remember in the past where you know we were doing um, performance reviews. 360 performance reviews were beginning to become very popular in the early 80s. And what we've done is taken that concept, that 360, and just turned it around to say, how do others that I've worked with view me? So it's that 360 related to my behaviors uh, on the job, on that particular job. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So that's the view that you are missing that you don't have today with a traditional telephone check process, and that you don't get in the interview, and you don't get from a self-assessment. So, you know, I always tell a quick little story. If you ask my family, if you ask me if I'm a good driver and what are my driving behaviors, I would tell you I always follow at least two car lengths behind and I never slam on the brakes and I make a complete stop. And so I have all the right behaviors. If you ask my family what are my behaviors when driving, I think you'd hear a very different story. So again, it's that perspective from others around you. How do they view your behaviors? Now, I think you all know that once you've made that hiring decision, if you've made a bad hire, it can have a major impact on your organization. There are a lot of costs. Rights management said it's really 2.5 times the annual salary. Um, I think it's, it's probably somewhere between 1 and 2.5 times the annual salary. But there's also things intangible that you can't put your finger on and you may not be able to put a dollar value to, but very detrimental when you think about um, the internal team turmoil and people having to pick up additional work responsibilities because somebody's not pulling their weight. Customer satisfaction, how many people just don't come back to your organization because they weren't helped or they weren't, um, their problem was not resolved in a timely fashion or the person on the other end of the phone didn't really care. Um, and then there's all the compliance issues that go along with that. In sales, and pro most organizations have somebody that's selling their goods or wares out, there's a cost of lost revenue, and that cost you'll never get back. 
Um, there's asset is time, and time is lost forever. So you don't ever get that back. You don't ever get the additional revenue. Um, and for clinical roles, if any of you are in the healthcare, today's environment is all around the structure around patient satisfaction. And uh, hospitals are being evaluated on how uh, they perform to patient satisfaction behaviors. And if they have Medicare and Medicaid patients, they're getting a percent payout based on how they perform those behaviors. We have the capability to look at those behaviors and help you screen for that so that you can hire people that exhibit those behaviors that will, in turn, lead to higher dollar payout. So I'm going to have you all, this is a huge number, 23.1 you know, million plus. Um, it's a large, large number. And yet it represents something that I think will shock most people. So, you know, you're probably thinking to yourself, I have no clue what she's talking about. I'm not sure what exactly that that represents. But let me give it to you in some real hard facts, some real terms. In one year, we were able to assess 3,500 sales candidates. This is just those that are applying for sales jobs. If looking at their competencies and their behaviors, using our tool, which is scientific and predictive of job success, 11% or 386 candidates came out as high risk. Those are candidates that you would want to avoid hiring. Why is that important? That 11% um, really could cost, if it was an average sale of 60000 and we know there's many software companies out there that sell software that's much higher than that, um, and, you know, there's companies all around. But just picking an average number of 60000 times 386 candidates, you get to that $23 million number. So it, it doesn't take long to get to that amount, and that's lost revenue for organizations. It's, it's pretty clear it falls to the bottom line. So the stats really do speak for themselves. So when you're looking at a new strategic approach, what can we do differently? If you do the same thing over and over, you're going to get the same results. If you're trying to impact quality of hire and you're trying to impact and reduce your turnover, these are the things that you want to consider. Today's approach, you do all the front end things, the phone interview, the face to face, you check the resume. Maybe you do that personality assessment. Uh, up front, and then you talk to the candidate and you hear all the things you want to hear, so it still doesn't help you really dig deeper uh, underneath for that candidate to say, are they the right individual for our organization? Do they exhibit the right behaviors? In today's approach, you know, you would pick up the phone and 76% of you are, are calling these references, and they know who they're talking to, and they'll give you very you know, kind of surface level information. Sometimes you get a golden nugget, but usually it's, oh yeah, they're a terrific person, and I would recommend them, and I'd hire them again, and they're a great team player, and, and so you hear real surface level information. The shift is to make it more strategic, to give you data, to give your hiring manager data. So what we have been able to do is take this assessment, make it online and automated, it goes out to at least five references, two being former managers, three colleagues or peers, and what you get back is a very detailed report in competency clusters that gives you the behaviors of that particular job. We've got over 300 surveys that are job related, and you're going to get information around dependability, ethics. Um, problem solving and adaptability, interpersonal skills, the teamwork, personality. So you're going to get those behaviors around the competencies. In comparison to what you're getting today, so the typical phone check, you know, you typically, um, it'll take you five to ten days as we just kind of shared with you to really get anybody on the phone and get any information, well, you're going to save yourselves a lot of time and a lot of energy because this takes about 30 seconds to kick off, and you're going to get this information in less than two days. And then secondly, it's going to help you really pause that decision or think about that hiring decision. Most of you said, you know what, we use this information. In fact, 92% of you use this information. That's terrific. And what if we could give you more information? 
what if you had more detailed behavior information that you could identify 5 to 10 percent that could be considered a high-risk candidate. And we know those individuals that fall in that area are more likely to turn over based on the data that we've researched. And um, we have tons of data, and we've got IO psychologists that go through it and identify some of these um, key criteria. So you in a better process, we're going to talk about improving quality of hire, hiring managers, interview effectiveness, because you only want to send over quality individuals to your hiring manager. You want to help them. You want to be a partner with them. We're going to look at efficiencies for both you and your hiring managers. And then really important, and I, I find this interesting, the passive sourcing. Um, I've been to a couple of conferences lately where everybody's talking about that passive candidate. How do we get those individuals into our system? Those that have jobs today didn't know they were looking for a job yet they have self-selected themselves to learn more about our organization. And in fact, uh, in that contest that was online, there was an individual in there that talked about, gee, I hated to see this guy go, but hey, do you have anybody I can replace them with? So you guys probably all do this on the phone when you're talking to a reference. Um, you probably ask them, gee, maybe you're somebody that would like to work here. You seem to have all the right uh, behaviors. So if not, we're going to give you an automated way to do that. We're going to drive compliance and consistency. One thing you don't want to worry about is risk. And of course, at the end of the day, it's really elevating your role, making sure that you've got a seat at the table and that your hiring managers see you as a partner. So we're going to go through a report, but I do want to kind of lay out what we look at. Um, there are individuals that have minimal developmental needs. Those are the folks that you'll see in these reports that um, appear on the far right side. They high, very high behaviors. They have exhibited these behaviors to a high degree. Um, and people have, have really reflected on that and provided some feedback. Then there are those individuals that are moderate. Medium, um, they, they rate bout medium. They have moderate developmental needs. Um, they typically will require some additional onboarding, maybe some additional coaching and mentoring. You may choose to bring them on board, but you may have somebody who scores in the 80 to 85 percent and therefore just allowing you to pass over these individuals. And then there's these 5 to 10 percent that are, are just simply high risk. They probably should be avoided. You would have a very difficult time bringing them up to speed and making them productive quickly. Their behaviors that they represented in the past, based on their references, is probably not where you want them to be. So looking at improving your hiring manager's interview effectiveness, we know that hiring managers, when they're interviewing people, they're looking for core differences. What makes this person different than this one? And sometimes you'll hear from them, you know, if HR, being in HR in the past, you know, what did you think of this candidate? What made them stand out? Well, gosh, you know, I just really liked them. We had a great conversation. Um, they seem to just fit well with my personality. Well, you know, hiring managers don't do this every day, and we're looking for people that are sometimes like us, but it may not be the best candidate. So the solution allows you to be more strategic in that. Give your hiring manager a tool they can use to then ask some additional probing questions. So tell me about a time. It's really based on behavior-based interviewing techniques. That's the way the behavior questions are written. So you know, tell me about a time that you had to meet your budget and you were under uh, pressure, time constraint, and dollar constraint. Give me some examples. Because they scored low in that area based on their past behavior, you would want to ask some additional probing questions. We all know that you know, improving efficiency really does support um, you know, uh, the time that it takes to fill a job. And for all of you, you're probably being, many of you may even have that criteria that you have to meet, you know, how time to fill. How long does it take you? Well, one thing that we've learned over the years, and we didn't develop this, GSK actually, um, through an executive uh, board, they had developed this process based on necessity, really. But what they identified, and I'll just kind of play this all out, is 
you know, they would go through source all of their candidates and put them through all of the screening, phone interviews, maybe some self-assessment, anything else that, you know, maybe even a first level interview. And then when they get to their top three candidates, they would then um, put them through skill survey. So ask them for their references and start the online process. What happens then is that you identify those individuals that may have interviewed really well, have the right credentials, but don't exhibit the appropriate behaviors. You can eliminate them from the process and now send over only those to your hiring manager that really do fit all of your criteria uh, that you've put in place. What this does is really does improve your time to fill because if you don't do if you do it at the end of the process which is much more traditional many of you probably if we asked you where do you use the reference checking it would be contingent upon an offer we hear that probably 80% of the time well what happens if somebody comes back with low performing behaviors based on their references many times you move them forward just because it's too painful to have to go back and try to fill that position and go through the process so what you do is really improve your hiring process and you become very efficient in your hiring managers now. Whichever uh, decision they make on candidate A or B, either one is a good decision. This is a real quick case study just kind of talking about um, the efficiency for the recruiting team. Uh, Tim Keith is their VP of Talent Acquisition and you know he is a Six Sigma, I think it's a black belt that he has and so he measures everything in those terms. They went from 60 work weeks using the traditional phone method of picking up the phone to a very strategic method of skill survey and they're down now to 4.8 weeks and that was in a year's time and they reference checked 2,272 job candidates. So you can see using the telephone down to skill survey really reduces the time spent uh, that you're on the phone chasing people down, but it improved their quality of hire um, because they're getting far more information. And then there's the passive sourcing that I talked about. Um, passive sourcing is really that something that probably all recruiters do. I'll bet all of you have done this in the past where you've asked them if they'd be interested in position, but we've automated the process. So at the end of the process, after they've been a reference, they can then say, hey, I'd like to know more about job opportunities at Company X. And at that point, they've opted themselves into the database. You now get all of their contact information, and you've got a warm lead. So we know great people know great people. They work with terrific people in the same industry, and now instead of a cold lead off of Monster or wherever you get those leads, you've now got a warm lead. Somebody knew them, and they're interested, and in fact, they're passive because they're probably working today. And then probably the most important piece of this and why legal decided, uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s that they should stop companies should stop doing telephone reference checking was because of the risk that it posed for organizations. Well, with skill survey, we really looked at the science, the compliance, and risk mitigation. And really important that if you use any sort of automated survey assessment that you're asking about the job, you need to be sure that the questions validate what they're actually doing. They need to be job-related, behavior-based questions. And because of that, um, the questions should be predictable of future behavior. Um, and the questions should be asked in a way through, you know, um, experts like our team of IO psychologists that really reduce risk. You wouldn't ask somebody about, and I'll just give you an example. This is one that somebody got sued on. Um, and they were taken to court was that they knew a certain high school produced higher socioeconomic individuals than one of the other high schools in the area. So they would ask the candidate, where'd you go to high school? Well, that, that certainly created bias and can get you into big trouble. So again, you want the, the tool that you're using, the instrument, the survey, the assessment to be validated against job, job related behavior based questions and have it validated. Um, we also do all of the EEOC and OSCCP compliance following the four-fifths rule.
so there's no adverse impact, no differences between subgroups. So you can be assured that you're meeting that criteria, and we've got data that uh, supports that. And then, of course, it's a standardized process. You're doing using the same instrument based on the job role across the board so that everybody gets asked the same questions, making it very consistent based on that job. So it's really about a clear um, you know, return on investment for finance. It's quality of hire, improving that quality of hire. If you hire people of a higher quality, you typically don't turn over. So reducing your turnover, improving your efficiencies, just that 92% reduction at CH2M Hill was hugely um, efficient for them, and the payoff was, was quite large. And then you get all these passive sourcing candidates that uh, hopefully you know, you can hire some folks from there. And we have many, many customers, over 700 customers. Many of them have made hires through the passive sourcing. And then, of course, elevating the role. I'm going to take you quickly through the process. It's really simple, simple, simple. I can't stress that enough. It's a five-step process. Recruiting is only involved in step one and step five. You enter the candidate's uh, information, first, last name, the, the position they're applying for, for, and you select the appropriate survey based on the job role. And again, there's about 300 to pick from. Uh, and we can narrow that down so that you, know, you don't have to look at all of them, depending on the environment you're in. Your candidate enters each one of their references. The references then um, will respond, takes them about 10 minutes. They get an email. They respond anonymously. Um, it's confidential, so people will be very candid. And then in the background, our engines are working. We aggregate the information. And you get it to leverage this report. So you've got a very detailed report in front of you. Just quickly across the board, you can see the survey availability. We go all the way up to the C-suite. Uh, really important high return there. We've had uh, instances where they've avoided a CFO that was in the you know, 200 plus uh, salary range and just the cost savings on that one position alone was huge. All the way to your entry level, your skilled trade workers, um, safety issues around that, um, your medical coding and billing. We have a number of different roles. This is where the, the uh, recruiter enters the information. You can see just five fields, very simple, enter first, last name, the position they're applying for, and then from there, you select the appropriate survey. In this case, it's a sales position. You just click on that, send the candidate an email. Recruiting is done until the report is ready to be viewed. Just giving you a, a you know, just a bird's eye view, if you will, of some of the different um, surveys that we have available. If you look at finance, we all know one size does not fit all. Um, the behavior of, you know, a auditor is different than the behavior of a payroll person or the behavior of a tax professional. So again, you want the appropriate surveys. And we can tell you from the data that we've collected over uh, the last few years is that 13.9% come back in that moderate to great developmental needs, making them a risky hire. So again, we've got the data that supports this is what you can typically find uh, in these roles. IT, you can see there's a number of IT roles because everyone requires a little bit different behaviors and you want to have the right behaviors for that position. And you can see here about 15% of all those IT positions come back in the risky or moderate to great developmental need area. Others, you know, you can see customer service, it's at about 12%. And then, of course, we've got healthcare. We've got a myriad of healthcare, about 97 specific healthcare surveys alone in different groups. Um, because we know a physician has different behaviors than your receptionist, your medical receptionist, or your technical person, your audiologist, your physical therapist. So again, you want to have very specific behaviors that are all validated against job success. And about 13% of those come back in the low uh, area or risky, again, great to moderate developmental needs. So at that point, you've uh, sent the candidate an email. Candidate gets an email that says, thank you for your continued interest in the position of major account sales uh, at this company. And it gives them some instruction of what they need to do next. 
candidate clicks on that, enters all their references, just like you would if they were filling out a form, and then they sign that legal waiver. This makes lawyers really happy. Um, I can tell you of a large healthcare organization I worked with, and um, the VP of HR said, look, Sherry, you know, this is going to be really tough. I'm not sure that we can get approval from our legal team. We don't check references here. And the reason we don't is because it's really risky. And so I got on the phone with the lawyer. We walked through the process, and he looked at the waiver, and he said, done deal. I'm happy. This is exactly what we needed. You're asking the same question for every single, you know, like job, and they're signing a legal waiver that releases everybody of liability. This is what we need in order to do reference checking. So he was delighted, uh, and we moved forward. They can't move forward, the candidate, until they have accepted the terms and conditions. So then, you know, an email goes out to your reference. It just gives them some instructions that they're going to be responding to this behavior-based uh, assessment. It's on an extent scale. One, you never um, observe them exhibiting that behavior. And seven, they always exhibited that behavior. And if they didn't observe them, then they can select NO. So you can see, this is just uh, 15. Most of our surveys, on average, have about 27 questions. And this one is sales related. So you see the behaviors that are different. Consistently meet or exceed sales goals. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know any salesperson that in an interview would say, oh, you know, I don't usually meet my sales goals, but I think you should hire me anyhow. Um, and in fact, you guys, somebody responded uh, on the contest that said uh, just that. They got the reference that, gee, this person's a great, great guy, but never meets their sales goals. So again, you want that kind of information. You want to, you know, this is about building strong, positive working relationships. So you get this kind of information, and then it's aggregated with all of their references. There's also an area where they can give you very specific information, work-related strengths, areas of work improvement. This information, even on those high performers, those A-plus players, you can use to develop a learning plan for them so that they can be productive right out of the gate. It also helps you make those decisions, should we really bring this person on board? And we've had things that have said, you know, um, hygiene is a big problem for this person. Or they're hot-tempered and they don't get along with others. And so, again, you get a lot of information uh, through this piece. And then this is that opt-in, that passive candidate component. Uh, would you like to know more about job openings? And then they can select this. If they do select that, we drive them right to the career page. So eBay is one of our clients. Um, it can move them right to the career page. And from there, they can look and see, gee, maybe there is a good fit for me, and maybe there is an opening for me. If not, they go into the database, and the recruiters can reach out. So we're going to go into the report that's really actionable. And it's information that, to this level of detail, I would again kind of submit to you that think about what you ask on the phone, the number of questions. You may ask five. You may ask 10. But think about that que question that you ask and how you aggregate that with all the references, and then how you compare that candidate to candidate, your top three candidates. Are you asking exactly the same question? Are any of them leading, leading into other information? So this is what the report looks like. Front page is just information. I'll talk about that red highlight there. Um, but what you get is what is a good fit. This is a good validated candidate. You see all the way over to the right. This breakout is what their former manager thought of them. So at least two have responded, and it's like them tapping you on the shoulder saying, I'd like to tell you about this candidate and the observable behaviors. And then you can see there's a really tight reference um, distribution of overall score. So very high, high, and, and a medium. But this is how it aggregates overall. So the first cluster is professionalism. And you see these are pretty high over in the right. Yet there are areas. You can see they gave it some thought. They're not all the same. And there are areas where they did have maybe a little bit um, more difficult uh, time meeting that particular behavior. So they weren't always up to date on products, features, and policies. And this is the level of agreement. So there was really high. If it's zero, everybody agreed on that behavior. A one is just one point difference of opinion. So very high agreement. Conversely, what you might see on a low-scoring candidate, 
So over here to the left, you'll see medium low. This is what their former managers thought. This is an aggregate of all. Here's the distribution. And then you get, again, those clusters, professionalism. All of the behaviors that would fall under professionalism for this particular job. So when you look at this, again, a lot of consideration given. Look at the variation of the scoring. So they aren't just kind of marking down, you know, high, 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 high. Consistently meet or exceed sales goals. Didn't do that so much. So again, something that you may want to probe in, and especially most salespeople can sell themselves, so they probably interviewed really well. Um, interpersonal skills. They have issues building strong, positive working relationships. Uh, maintain strong relationships with customers by frequent communication and accountability. That didn't seem to happen either. So again, things you want to know before you would bring this person onto the job and risk your um, you know, sales numbers because, again, remember, you can't get those back. So it takes a long time for somebody to become productive, uh, and you lose the time if you make a, a bad hiring decision. And then this one is alignment. Uh, this is a healthcare one. So I just wanted to show you this for any of our healthcare uh, folks that are on the phone. This is the HCAP behaviors. We take every healthcare survey and map it to those HCAP uh, behaviors. And you can see here, um, if this individual does not exhibit those behaviors to a high degree, chances are that your overall rating, your HCAP rating, could be lower than it should be. And therefore, your payout will suffer from Medicare and Medicaid. Verbatim comments, just that, exactly what the reference said about this particular candidate. And you know they come out on this report just as they were stated. So again, one bullet point for each person. You don't know who said what, um, but you get all of the information. And then this is the could improve. Tends to work alone. If this person is supposed to work with the team, that could be a problem. Very demanding for himself and his teammates. If they're you know managing others, that could be a problem. So again, you can you can see how uh, these. Um, responses could really help you either A, develop that person, or B, make a decision not to bring them in. Passive candidate, just that. It's a database where they can, you can go in and search those names and reach out to these individuals and make phone calls. They're probably from like companies, and uh, you get everything across the board, all titles. So again, it's about you. It's about a better process. It's about being strategic. Um, it's about building a relationship with your hiring managers, reducing turnover, efficiency. It's an easy and quick win for the HR organization. You guys save time and energy. You get more detailed information. You don't put the company at risk because they are validated, scientific, compliant, and uh, no risk in doing this. So um, I hope that I've been able to share with you a little bit about uh, skill survey, who we are. Um, I'll give you just a little more detail here. We've been in business for over 10 years, over 700 customers. We have a team of IO psychologists that develop our surveys. These are very, um, you know, the, the individuals have the school behind this and the knowledge to develop these surveys. Uh, and they continue to develop surveys to meet our clients' uh, needs. So you can see we've got like 12 in sales, 22 in the IT world. We have a patent pending. We were the inventors of online reference checking for a very valid reason, because people weren't doing it. And you really do need this kind of information. I call this really adoption. We've titled it Survey Usage and Growth. We've seen a huge growth over the last you know, five years, yet we know that, you know, if you look out over the industry, it's been a tough time for folks. And some we haven't been hiring as many people as I, I hope that we will be moving forward. Yet adoption has been, been very successful because you were getting no information, and now you're getting detailed behavior-based information to help you make a better quality decision. And I know that many of you are looking at how do we measure quality of hire? How do we know if we're hiring the best person for the job? And how do we reduce that turnover? And this is one tool 
that can absolutely help you with that, very strategic. So thank you very much for spending your part of your day with me. I hope it's been informative. I hope you've learned something, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Sherry, thank you very, very much. That was a great presentation. Uh, so for everyone on the call uh, at this time, uh, you will have a, an you do have an opportunity now to ask questions uh, to Sherry. We're going to take those questions over uh, the, the Q&A uh, panel there, and uh, let's try to use the, the Q&A panel as opposed to the chat. I do see some people using that. Uh, go ahead and put your questions in there and we'll we'll get started answering a few that have come in already sherry uh for those of you on the call wondering yes we will be recording this this has has been recorded i should say and yes uh all of that will be available um specifically in the next uh 30 minutes or so uh, we will have that posted on the site and an email out to everybody uh today uh, so sherry let's start with the first question uh that's here this is a uh, question regarding uh planning i guess do you have a plan for small one recruiter offices uh, that would like to leverage reference checking? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of clients um, that are in small organizations. Um, you know, many under 25 employees or 50 employees, uh, some that are 250 employees. So whether you're a one-person organization recruiter or a team of 35, this process works for you. Um, again, if you're only one person recruiting, then you absolutely can use the time savings and the efficiency that this provides because it takes you literally less than a minute to start the process and in less than two days you're going to have a report. So, um, And that's going to allow you to do more uh, strategic things um, required of you, especially if you are a one-person uh, HR group. Great. And let's go ahead. We have a couple more questions here. Do many customers use this before final interviews? If so, can you give an example of how I might use it? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Um, we seventy percent of our clients use this before the final interviewing process. So once they've narrowed it down to their top three to four uh, candidates, then they ask them to um, you know go through the skill survey process. The so recruiters, you know, uh, kick off that process. The less than you know thirty seconds to start it. And then when you get the report back, there are two things. One, we have a candidate comparison report. So you can compare your top candidates for that particular job in one report. And then additionally, you can use the individual report to now have a discussion with your hiring manager and say, hey, should we bring this person in for a final interview? Or simply tell them that there are a couple of others that are more qualified it really does then become a tool. We also have what's called a hiring manager summary and interview questions. So you can give that to your hiring manager, which gives them the high-level clusters, how that individual performed, and then a couple of behavior-based questions for each one of those competency clusters. So our clients are using it very successfully, and quite frankly, the hiring managers love it because now they've got more data to help them with the whole interviewing process. Great. And, Cherry, we have a question that came in. It's, a, it's actually a very interesting one. I'm sure one that's on the minds of a lot of people out there about the, valid the validity of reference checking and who is actually completing those reference checks. So the question is, how do you keep candidates, family, or friends from completing the reference checks. And so the specific example would be if a candidate puts in a sister or a best friend or a brother-in-law's email for a reference, not sure the brother-in-law would be a good one though, depending, uh, or the candidate puts in their own alternate email. How do you prevent that yeah. person from giving a great reference? Yeah, so we, good, great question because, you know, we, we tend to be fairly sophisticated these days. So I didn't point out, I said I'd talk about that red um, IP address. Well, we're doing a couple things. We're looking, that's the first thing, is that we look at that IP address and we compare it to all the other IP addresses who answered the survey. So in that report that you get, you get all of the references. You know who responded to the survey. And then you can see if that IP address matched the IP address on the front. Now, there are times that's perfectly acceptable. 
Um, and I'll give you an example. There was a, a client in, in Texas, in Dallas, who had worked at one location for 13 years, and all of her references came from that location. So they all had the same IP address, but their email address was all work uh, email address. So that made perfect sense. Yet we've had cases where there's a Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, and they all have the same IP address, which really indicates that there's probably something wrong with that. So we've been able to catch those, and we're continuing to look at how valid their references are. So this next year, we've got, uh, we're looking at that even um, at a little more in depth, so that we'll give you kind of that um, that overview of does this look like a valid reference from that perspective. But right now, we track the IP addresses. Great, and, and this one's not necessarily on the software itself, but I think it's more around, um, I guess, a theory or, or, or your individual thoughts here. What do you think about employees Googling candidates to complete their own reference checks? Gosh, you know, that's certainly out of my my wheelhouse to, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure of the legality around that. I know there's a whole th bunch of information on from, you know, attorneys talking about, you know, should they, should you look at Facebook, should you Google them and look at their background, is that fair? We certainly don't get into that part of it. Uh, we just look at behaviors, work-related behaviors, and we have their references respond. So unfortunately, I'm not the expert in that area, but thank you for asking. Okay. And how customizable is the solution? Can we customize the questions for key hires? Yeah. So we do have a component that you can add your customized questions. But let me be really clear um, that typically people that use that part of our solution are trying to capture cultural questions, like would you be a good cultural fit here at this organization? Our behavior-based questions are all validated. Remember, validated against job success, so they're job related. We can customize a survey for you, but if we do that, we like to ensure that it is still a validated question. So we're happy to customize a survey. What we have found that, you know, probably 99% of our clients go with our surveys that are already created because they are job related and we do have so many to pick from. But happy to work with you on A, creating your own questions using our, our custom question creation and B, if you don't find what you need, then our IO psychologist will work with you to create the appropriate question. Okay, great. And I think we can take, uh, we have time for one more, so let's go ahead and take um, one more. This one's about uh, Taleo and other ATS uh, systems. Does Skill Survey integrate with Taleo and other systems? Yeah, we, we do. Skill Survey does integrate with Taleo, Enterprise Edition, uh, both 10 and 12. Um, so we do that. ISIMS, we integrate with ISIMS. We integrate with Healthcare Source. Um, we have a number of other integrations. We're working on an in another integration today with a, a different ATS. So um, we have some standard callouts, and we're very comfortable integrating with ATSs. Okay, great. And uh, so we're we're good here. I think we have we have more questions coming in, but we we can hold on those uh, because we are coming up against the hour, and we still need to give away the uh, the the uh, tablets, the Nexus Seven. So uh, not sure how how the, how you all wanted to do that. Uh, I know that we we chose those names of the people that were on the call, or the people uh, that had uh, left some responses on the. Uh, on the posting on the contest that we had on the site and so Sherry can you walk us through how how did you guys choose uh, the, these well, you individuals know what? I'm to turn, you know I'm going to let Shannon walk you through how the team selected the winners and and again thank you for everybody that submitted they were they were really fun so Shannon can you walk through that process yeah absolutely so hi everyone thank you for being a part of our presentation today and Thank you, Sherry. Uh, I am Sherry's colleague. I'm the marketing manager here at Skill Survey, and I, I wanted to also thank the audience who participated in the in the discussion question. We based it on what we found to be either funny or just 
something we would have never thought that you would hear on a reference call. Um, it went through a very strenuous voting process, um, and by that I mean 10 of my fellow coworkers. Um, we all sat down and took a vote, uh, which we thought were, number one, the funniest, and number two, as I said, you know, the most outrageous that we, that we had thought. So, Ryan, would you like me to say the winner, or did you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, why, why don't you go ahead and do that. We, we do have two winners. We, we're giving away two Nexus 7s. Uh, for those of you who, who may or may not know uh, that are on the call. And we held a contest on the site where people went and just submitted their, their answers to the question. And so uh, the team over Skill Survey went ahead and chose uh, two winners. Uh, so without further ado, Shannon, go ahead. Yeah, so the first winner uh, that we got the most laughs out of was Amy Alla, or Alla, I apologize if I mispronounced that. And Amy wrote that during a call, she had asked, she had said, hi, I'm calling to check reference for Bob Smith. Bob Smith said you worked at company. Do you have a moment? And Bob, uh, Joe, who was the reference, responded, Bob, Bob Smith, that guy owes me 20 bucks, and then hung up on her. So thank you, Amy, for that very clever, or, well, it's not clever, but very funny response reply. And the second, I'm sorry Ryan, I'm trying to find our second winner so I could get her quote, uh, is also Amy, uh, Amy Wilson. And her, her reply was, my favorite was a former boss who told me all about the guy's family background, badmouthed him, and told me all kinds of bad things he'd done when he worked for him, um, that we shouldn't hire him, that we would re regret it. He went on and on and on. And then he said, at least if it's the Jeff I'm thinking about. If it's the other Jeff, then you should hire him. He was a great guy. I have trouble remembering which one is which. Was this the blonde guy? So this demonstrated how sometimes, uh, you know, we thought it was just so outrageous because here was a guy giving a reference and he wasn't truly sure who he was speaking about. So we thought that was really good as well. So congratulations, Amy Wilson, as well, and Amy Alla for your contributions to our discussion question.